Did you know that the great philosopher emperor Marcus Aurelius had a colleague, a co-emperor, Lucius Verus was his name, and he was a very interesting character. Ancient sources vilify him, unjustly, some scholars would say. He was in many ways an opposite of Marcus, rowdier, fond of crowds and action, maybe a bit of a party animal, but... As we delve into history, we find he was a man of considerable intelligence, good with words, who had a great relationship with the Roman army, and in many ways a complementary part to the more introspective, intellectually oriented Marcus Aurelius. Today, let's get to know Lucius Verus, how he came to power, what he did during his reign, and of course, let's look at some of his coins, struck at different moments in his life. Let's get started. And we start before Lucius became emperor. Actually, let's go to a very early period in his life. It's the year 136 AD. The young Lucius was just six years old. His father, Lucius Caonius Commodus, a Roman aristocrat, was picked by the aging emperor Hadrian as his heir to the imperial throne. This decision came as a bit of a surprise for everyone at the time. Everyone thought Hadrian was giving the empire to another candidate, but there it was. Lucius Aelius Caesar was the new imperial heir. And there were coins struck in Lucius Verus's dad's name. Here's the denitus of him. Now, we don't see anything about an emperor Aelius in our history books, because, well, the poor man died before becoming emperor at just 38 years old, just two years after his elevation to Caesar. This makes the coins struck in his name rather scarce. They aren't really rare. The empire was living some very prosperous times, so a lot of coins were struck each year. But since the man was around for just a couple of years, there wasn't a very long time to strike a large number of coins. In any case, here's a denitus of him, struck between 136 and 138 AD. It's a very pretty, but rather simple coin. On the obverse, we have the bust of the Caesar, with his curly hair and full beard, which was a fashion introduced by Hadrian. Before that, all emperors were clean-shaven. He doesn't wear the laurel crown, this was reserved for the emperor. And around the bust, some very simple legends. Aelius Caesar. I love the portraits on Roman coins around this time. The busts are consistently made in very fine style, and they pop out of the flan quite a lot. This high relief makes these coins so appealing. They look like tiny 3D sculptures. On the reverse, we have the image of Felicitas, the goddess of happiness, which made sense back then. The empire was living its golden age, and there was a relative level of prosperity. The goddess holds in one hand a caduceus, the symbol of commerce, and in the other, a cornucopia, the magic horn of abundance, out of which an endless torrent of grain, fruits, and all kinds of food would stream out of. Around the legends, it states the official positions Aelius held for that year. It reads, Tribunicia potestas, consul iterum, with tribunician powers for the first time, consul for the second time. Unfortunately, there were some tragic turn of events. With the sudden and early death of Lucius Aelius, it this sent the old and ailing Hadrian into a frenzy to find his replacement. He picked another man of senatorial rank, we know him as Antoninus Pius, the actual successor to Hadrian. But he did so with the condition that Antoninus adopted two young men that Hadrian considered ideal candidates to hold the mantle of emperor in the future. The young Marcus Aurelius and the star of today's episode, Lucius Verus, the son of the recently deceased Caesar. For the following 23 years, Rome saw a period of remarkable stability and peace under Antoninus. He raised the two boys as his successors, with the best education a Roman aristocrat could get. Marcus and Lucius were very different men. Cassius D. wrote, Marcus Aurelius was frail of body, and devoted a great part of his time to the letters. Lucius, on the other hand, was a vigorous man of younger years, fond of action, nicely suited for military affairs. Despite this difference in personalities, the two enjoyed their company and they had a harmonious relationship. There wasn't a single record of one trying to usurp a power from the other, and they seemed to be very fond of each other. 
Antoninus died in 161 AD. At first, the Senate wanted to elevate Marcus alone as emperor, but he insisted both were hailed as co-Augusti, the first time Rome was ruled by two men. So, here's the denarius issued that year, 161 AD, for Verus, so in his first year as co-emperor. While Marcus was already 40 years old when he became emperor, here we see a 30-year-old Lucius, with quite a young-looking portrait, with that bushy hair. Maybe this was made on purpose to better represent him as the junior partner between the co-emperors. The fact he isn't wearing the laurel wreath in this portrait, for me, makes him look even younger. Generally, the wreath gives the emperor on the coins an, an air of authority. And in this case, since he doesn't have it, he just looks like a young fellow, which he was. The legends show his new regnal name, Imperator Lucius Aurelius Verus Augustus. No sign of the Pontifex Maximus title, as it was reserved for Marcus as the senior emperor. On the reverse, we have Providentia Deorum, the goddess of fate, or divine providence, holding a globe, representing the Roman world, and a cornucopia, the, once again the horn of abundance. After the name of the goddess, we have the imperial titles Verus had occupied up to that year. Tribunicia Potestas Iterum, Consul Iterum. So he was consul and had tribunician powers for two years. It's quite surprising to see how Marcus and Lucius shared power so harmoniously. It could be the case that their relationship wasn't as good, as harmonious as the sources make us believe, but for a Roman emperor, backstabbing, assassination and intrigue were, were the norm. There was always someone trying to topple you, but it really didn't seem to be the case for these two. This is where I give Marcus a lot of credit. He was a pragmatic man. He knew he wasn't the best general or soldier Rome had to offer. Yes, having a co-emperor meant, in theory, a huge risk, but Verus was the best bet he had to be the muscle of his government while he took care of the administration that huge state required. Here's a Cistercius struck for Marcus. This coin is also dated to the year 161, so the first year as co-emperors. The obverse of this coin shows how Marcus was the senior of the two emperors. Compared to the previous portrait of Lucius we just saw, here we have a serious, mature bust of Marcus, wearing the laurel wreath, looking forward with this very stern expression. In the legends, we find the title of Pontifex Maximus, the chief priest of the Roman religion, a position Lucius did not have. And this indicated a slight superiority over his brother. The full legends of the obverse read, Imperator, Caesar, Marcus Aurelius, Antoninus Augustus, Pontifex Maximus. On the reverse, a beautiful show of unity and cooperation between the two emperors. We have this really nice image of Lucius and Marcus, who were co-consuls that year, holding hands. I love how the engraver actually went through the work of sculpting their bushy hair and curly beard as well, instead of just making two random figures. Under the design, we have the legends Consul Tertium, since this particular coin was issued for Marcus, and this was his third consulship, we have the Cos III here, instead of Lucius' second consulship. There were similar coins issued for Lucius Verus, but in these you would see a consul II, consul iterum, as he was his second consulship. And finally, around the legends, it reads, Concordia Augustorum, the concord between the emperors. Sadly, the reign of Marcus and Lucius saw the end of the long-lived Pax Romana, the so-called Roman peace, as the empire was once more threatened by foreign enemies, between 161 and 166 AD, the Parthian Empire declared war on Rome and Armenia, by this time a Roman client kingdom. At first, frontier troops were mobilized to try to defeat the Persian menace, but they were crushed. Marcus sent Lucius east with a big imperial army to crush the Parthians once and for all. Lucius established his base of operations in Antioch, the largest city of the Roman East. Here, sources say that Lucius neglected on his responsibilities as an emperor, preferring to indulge in parties and drinking, delegating the fighting to his generals. There is a degree of plausibility in this, Lucius was a bit of a party animal, but on the other hand, despite 
accounts saying he was a young, energetic man. He didn't seem to have a lot of military experience. Let's remember he grew up during the reign of Antoninus, a time of remarkable peace. So staying out of the front lines and managing the war from a distance seems like a seems like a reasonable proposition, just as a representative of the imperial house, while the proper generals dealt with the situation. So next, let's have a look at one of these small bronze coins, the pocket change of Antioch that was circulating around when Lucius was in the city having some fun. Antioch was originally a Greek city, meaning it struck coins in Greek standard. So what we have here is probably an obol, so one-sixth of a silver drachma. In terms of size, to compare it against its contemporary imperial coins, this piece sits between a semis and an ass at around 8 grams of weight. Under this very impressive orange desert patina we have, we would see a yellowish metal. This coin was likely made out of brass, an alloy of copper and a bit of lead. On the obverse, nothing unusual, just the laureate bust of Lucius, with the legends in Greek, quite similar to what you would find in coins written in Latin. Autocratoros, Caesaros, Lucius Aurelius Sebastos. On the reverse, a very common design for base metal coins of Antioch. A laurel wreath, the symbol of imperial largesse, and the letters SC for Senatus Consulto, or approved by the Senate, showing this coin, despite having no precious metal content in it, was supposed by law to be acceptable as payment, linking it legally to other higher denominations that did have intrinsic value to it. We know this today as fiduciary value. Important cities like Antioch did have councils that ruled over the city and the whole province of Syria, a very important frontier area. I wonder if the Senate this coin refers to, it's actually a Senate in Antioch, or if it's the original Senate back in Rome. How much Lucius participated or neglected his responsibilities in war, we might never know. What we do know is that Rome won the war, pushing back the Parthians, sacking their capital, and restating a Roman client king in Armenia. Here's a denarius that celebrates the return of Lucius Verus to Rome in 166. Now here we have a change in portraiture. Now Lucius looks as serious and as prestigious as his older brother with a laurel wreath and looking more mature, with a serious expression on his face. As a Roman general, if you defeated a foreign enemy, you were entitled to add to your name a title that reflected your accomplishments. On the legends of this coin, we read Lucius Verus Augustus, so his normal name, then we see Armeniacus, or conqueror of the Armenians, Partico Maximo, the great conqueror of the Parthians. On the reverse we have Pax, the Roman goddess of peace. Keep in mind, for the Romans, the idea of peace isn't the peaceful and benign peace we think about. Pax was a key component of the whole idea of Imperium, the idea that Rome was entitled to submit any uncivilized peoples by force, and as a result of this military might, things such as peace would come. So yeah, a deity that looks nice and benign with her little cornucopia and an olive branch she's holding, a symbol of peace, but there is a serious message of don't mess with us behind this coin. Under her, we have the name of the goddess, Pax, and on the legends, the imperial titles of Lucius. Tribunicia Potestas for the sixth year, Imperator for, so commander-in-chief for the fourth year, Consul Iterum, consul for the second time. Some other coins of this commemorative series are much more direct about the idea of Roman might over its enemies. Other reverse types show Parthian captives sitting on the ground with their hands tied to their backs ready to be sold into slavery. We can see they are Parthians for the kind of clothes they are wearing in their little hat. While on others, like this lovely gold aureus, we see Lucius galloping at full speed, holding a javelin and trampling a Parthian soldier. Rome might have been victorious in battle, but Rome's armies returned to the empire, carrying another mighty enemy, the Antonine Plague. This disease killed approximately 10% of the empire's population, leading to a weakening of the army 
and causing a collapse of the economy, which would help plunge Rome in the period of crisis it went through in the following century. This disease, likely smallpox, was what ended prematurely Lucius Verus's life, at least according to contemporary sources. In 169, when campaigning with Marcus in the Danube frontier, Lucius fell ill and died a few days later. New interpretations of the facts leading to his death led us to believe he might not have died from the plague, due to how quickly he died. Keep in mind, smallpox can take over a week to kill someone, and the fact he was with Marcus the whole time, and Marcus didn't fall sick. Whichever reason it was, Lucius was gone at the early age of 38, leaving Marcus alone to deal with an empire seeing the end of its golden age. Lucius was deified by the Senate, and a series of coins were issued for the occasion of his deification. Let's have a look at one of these coins, a denarius struck in 169 at the Mint of Rome. On the obverse, we once more have the bust of Lucius, once again without the laurel crown, as he wasn't ruling the empire anymore. I don't know if this was made on purpose by the engraver, or that's just from the way of sculpting the die, but Lucius's face looks rather bleak, with his deep, sunken eyes, don't you think? A sad expression after a sad loss for the empire, at a time it really needed an emperor. The legends are rather simple. Divus Verus, stating this, his new title as a divus, a person who ascended into godhood. On the reverse, we have a massive and heavily decorated funerary pyre. It's, it's four stories tall, that must have been huge. Roman emperors were cremated in a public ceremony, so that their ashes could fly up towards the gods up in the heavens, with any remains being put in an urn and deposited in the mausoleum of Hadrian. The legends read Consecratio, once again stating Lucius' consecration into the divine. And so it ends, the story of Lucius Verus, Maybe not the best Roman emperor, but most likely not as bad as sources tell us. Lucius could have had at least some good 30 years ahead of him wasn't for the Antonine Plague. I wonder how history would have turned out if he lived for longer. How about you? Have you got a coin of Lucius Verus? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Leave a like and consider subscribing if you did. Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.